I don't really feel any particular reason to tell the truth, but I also think that a poem is aiming toward a kind of truth, a truth that is bigger than what the poem is, you know, than the, than the, ele the individual elements of the poem itself. Yep. It's a book about trying to figure out um, how to how to live. How do you live while around you people are dying? How do you learn to live with tremendous loss, with that sort of pain? That is um, the job of the living. That's a thing that we have to figure out how to do. It happens in human lives. It's you know it's perfectly normal. And, um, but it is something that um, one, I think, needs to kind of reckon with. And uh, this book was my attempt to really do, do that. I think perhaps unlike my other books, there's, um, I, I think a lot of what's in this book is actually really funny. I don't know that other people think it that way. I think, I think some people, you know, it's, it, see it as very serious, but I think that there's parts of it that are actually rather kind of hilarious, but Maybe that says more about my, my sense of humor than, than other, other people. Um, I don't really work that way, you know, sort of working on a kind of a poems that are a kind of project. I think mostly my poems that I'm writing are um, a sort of natural outgrowth of the lived life of the things that I'm doing and thinking about and um, and my obsessions, right? So I, one of the things that they certainly are is um, uh, they represent my kind of obsessive interests in particular things. For a long time, I had this uh, interest in going to the, some of the coldest places in the world, going to the um, places north of the Arctic Circle in the winter. And I was just really interested in what in this, in coldness, and the idea of these sort of places and how one lives a life there. I spent like 10 days on a reindeer sled in northern Finland and Sweden in the winter, winter camping and, you know, learning how to drive a reindeer. Um, and that was this very adventurous and transformative experience that I had and, you know, wrote about it in this, in this book. But how I sort of landed on that, I don't know. I think it was just a it's, I've sort of clung to my childhood fantasies, I think, maybe like many writers. And when I became older and figured out how to sort of make some of those things happen, I didn't hesitate to do it. So like riding on a reindeer sled through Lapland in the winter, um, you know, I can probably point to the very book I read as a child where that was taking place and thought, now there's something to do, you know? So um, I wonder how you do that. The, you know, the, the vehicle of the poem is also a, is a way of kind of asking questions and searching for answers. And it's not the poem, I don't believe it's the poem's job to, you know, solve or resolve to kind of uh, crib a little bit from Keats and his notion of negative capability, right? That, that the poem doesn't solve or resolve anything. The poem's job is to create a kind of house into which um, tension can can live and remain active. That's what I think of poems as being, as sort of a place where, where perhaps two contradictory impulses are being held together long enough for them to vibrate and echo and, and sound off each other. I think that that's how I approach the writing of poems. I also really believe that our poems are smarter than we are. They reveal things about us that we don't understand about ourselves. I think of I think of the writing of poetry as trafficking in the psychological, in the in the spiritual, in so far as that exists, and um, and you know, and it it intersects and uses language as the as the the base of that as its form. Um, language, as we know, is incredibly flawed, but one of the jobs of poets is to revive and, you know, revivify the language, to refresh it, 
to create, allow new meanings to enter into the language, to help it slough off its many uses in commerce, in the buying and selling of the material world, in, in aggression, in making war. And poetry is a place where we get to rejuvenate the language in certain ways and show it what it's, show any reader what it's possible to do. Whenever people start talking about those kinds of things, I am always concerned that what they're doing is prefiguring or overly domesticating the poem by, by thinking that it needs to be responsible to someone or something, that a poem needs to be like a good citizen. Poems don't have to be anything other than themselves. Poetry doesn't, it only has to kind of speak to the condition of poetry. And for me, they are vehicles where I exercise freedom. If one can't be free in your life, at least try and be free in your poems. Allow them to associate freely and wildly. That's what they're for. That for me, they are vehicles of the imagination. They are spaces in which we can kind of learn to live and exercise a freedom of intellect, a freedom of sort of free association, a freedom of, of aesthetic freedom. And, you know, and that's what, that is where their allegiance should lie. They traffic in the unknowable. They assign language to what we do not understand about ourselves and others and about the world. They are places where mystery um, attaches, is becomes attached to language. And that to me is an important function in and of itself. I feel like we're always asking poets and poems, like what are poems for and how poets functions in society and what are the roles of poets in society? The role of the poet in society is to write poems. That's it. That's the, that's it. That's like the sum total of what it is. There is no other responsibility. So, you know, literary devices are, are techniques and tools. They're ways of echoing the tradition of the art, of connecting your poetry to the poetry of the past that you've loved. Um, they're ways of refuting it, of arguing with it, of of, um, you know, um, developing an allegiance with it, whatever that is, but that's also what those things are doing. And I think, you know, one of the things that, what I think we're trying to do in poetry is, is distract the conceptual intellect enough so that the other part of our mind, the associative, the, the, um, the antisocial, the, um, the, the, the deep id and urge that we have in us, that that gets an opportunity to kind of come out and exercise, um, uh, whereas our, our sorting and conceptualizing intellect is occupied with these things like mechanical devices that it's going to try and employ in a poem. So it's sort of those two things where, where it's an inner conflict that we're, that we're, that we're, in, I think, when we're composing poems, when I think we're doing it in ways that are exciting. I'm going to read the poem that I uh, wrote at the Merrill House, um, one of them. And this was a, uh, this is the one poem that I read, that I wrote while seated at uh, James Merrill's desk. Um, uh, this, uh, I, I went there, um, one day and I was quite determined to sort of spend the day working, working, sitting at the desk. This is a poem in which I sort of attempted to kind of capture what I, I think of as the posthumous voice. It's a voice sort of from the beyond that felt kind of fitting, thinking of the Ouija board and thinking of the many seances and, uh, that had taken place in that space. And um, this poem is also based on uh, a poem by the, the poet C.D. Wright um, that I, I really love. And it's a kind of homage to that work and to her. So it's called To Whom It May Concern. In the Polaroid in a drawer of the house, the other relatives picked over. I'm the blur in the background, mop of silvery hair. The rasp of the ash pan when you empty the stove is a bit like my voice, stuck in the chimney like a nest. You won't have to know how I procrastinated of my abiding fear of snakes, or how I gave terrible presents when I bothered to give them at all. I was told by a psychic to remember the unloved dead, and so I did, 
but not in a way they would like, recalling how they got ugly when they drank or stole the loose change from the laundry when they thought nobody saw. I spent years writing my last letters, writing off the debt of a cold bed, pretending I was busy when really I was home, pinned to the couch by a cat. For money, I did many things, trapped muskrats, forged thank you notes, let men pet me while I danced. Mostly, I played the role of someone who cared, tilted in my chair and trying to appear engaged, the preoccupied uncle you weren't quite sure you liked. That's me smoking in the Winnebago, leaving the sink clean of air. I'm there deadheading the rhubarb nobody bothers to pick, and my worthless collections, rag rugs, concrete gnomes, were most likely put out in the trash. Sometimes I lied when I was bored. I wanted you to know what I knew, though I eventually gave that up, preferring to make you laugh. This life I led was mostly private, and hours were spent sweeping bat guano from a crumbling set of stairs. Nobody knew the half of it, and nobody seemed to care. I foresaw how neglected the town cemetery became, glimpsed in a vision the rusted fence that let in the deer. They stripped the bark from the junipers that eventually came down in a storm. I was in that storm, blown out across the ice toward Arcadia. That's a town in Wisconsin and not some name for paradise. Well, thank you.